Hey, Dr. H here. This video will be the Unit 8 review on ecology. The topics that I am going to go over here uh, will start with population ecology. Uh, that is all the members of a single species in a single area. And from there, we'll sort of get bigger and bigger. So we'll combine different populations into communities and look at how different species will interact with each other. And then I will go on and expand even further out to an entire ecosystem and bring in some ideas about how the biotic and abiotic factors work together, um, especially focusing on how energy and nutrients move through ecosystems. Okay, as usual, time codes for each of these sections will be found in the uh, description below. So let's go ahead and get started with part one, which will be population ecology. So for population ecology, uh, first off, uh, remember that the definition of a population is all the members of a single species that are all living in one particular geographical area. So in specific, what we are going to talk about here with regards to population ecology, some of the measures of population size and how that population size changes can be tracked. Um, I will then get into some different ways that populations are distributed and how they are structured throughout their uh, geographical range. So we'll first start with some population size and some population dynamics, right? Which is the study of changes in population size. Um, and we'll start here with some uh, theoretical models of population dynamics. So first, you know, some of the factors that will cause populations to change. Um, and very basically, they are uh, the birth rate and the death rate, right? Immigration, emigration, we don't really worry too much about. There are a few formulas that will be given to you on the formula sheet for the AP test, right? So the, the first few that we'll talk about here, uh, rate, right? change in y over change in time or dy dt right very simple formula um, and from that we can in regards to population size uh, we can measure the population growth as just simply the birth rate minus the death rate now we can expand upon that very simple formula by looking at a few different models of population growth right and the first one here is the exponential growth model. Right? And that formula is here, the one highlighted in green, right? We've added a few things to the, to the formula list where exponential growth um, is now equal to this R max value times N, which is the population size, right? And R max is the maximum per capita growth rate of a population. Looking at this equation on a graph, we see our typical exponential shape there, um, often referred to as a J-shaped curve. Looking at the effect of R max on the graph, right, the blue line there um, has an R max value of one, and the red line has an R max value of 0 0.5. So we see that the overall shape doesn't really change of these two graphs, just the sort of the steepness of the, uh, of the exponential growth period. This exponential growth model, um, is fairly limited since populations, as we learned back in unit seven, evolution, populations do not expand like that in size indefinitely, right? There are limits on the size of a population. So to take those limits into account, we have developed the logistic growth model. Right? And we have our final set of formulas here to complete um, the formula set that you will see uh, with the test. And that uh, logistic growth model is given by the formula dn dt equals r max times n times the value k minus n divided by k. Okay, so we're introducing this variable k, which uh, is short for the carrying capacity. And, and carrying capacity is the maximum population size that a certain area can support. When we plot this equation on a graph, 
we get our standard, what we call S curve, right? Where the population growth starts out very rapidly. And then as the population size grows and gets closer to that carrying capacity, the growth rate slows and the rate of growth will eventually level off at zero, right? When it actually reaches that carrying capacity. So comparing those two models on one graph, we have the exponential growth model there in blue uh, and the logistic growth model there in red with a carrying capacity of 1500. Okay, you may be asked to use those formulas. Uh, you may be asked to just analyze graphs, right? To calculate the carrying capacity, um, maybe even calculate the growth rate, right? Which is very simply just looking at the slope of the line, right? We should certainly be able to do those things right so these are the theoretical models of population growth what about real populations right what sort of patterns you know can, can do we actually see exponential growth and logistic growth in real populations um so i have a couple examples here of real populations showing both of those population trends um here in this population of elephants we see exponential growth um, and the reason that this population went through exponential growth is they uh, were protected right? Up around, I think it was around 1925, 1930 or so in this national park. Uh, elephant hunting was strictly forbidden and the elephants were now able to reproduce. And you see that the population took off very, very rapidly, right? Models um, goes very closely with our exponential growth model. Uh, a couple real populations here showing logistic growth. Um, these are both growing in the lab. The same ideas apply. See the population growth starts off very rapidly and then slows down as it reaches that carrying capacity. All right. And on the uh, the right hand side graph there, uh, we see something that's fairly typical. Um, this overshoot of the carrying capacity, right, where, where the population goes through that exponential growth phase, goes up above the carrying capacity for a good bit, and then drops back down, and then will stabilize around that carrying capacity. Okay, so that's um, some ideas about the size of populations. What about where the populations are, right? What is the distribution of the population, right? Not only um, across the globe, but within their specific geographical range where might we find this one particular species? And when researchers start looking into these questions, um, they make up little flowcharts, uh, much like this one, that will ask a series of questions about why does a certain species not appear in a certain location, right? And once they get a yes answer, they these do not stop asking these questions, right? Notice that there are arrows that follow all of the yes answers because all of these factors would come into play, right? Abiotic factors, biotic factors, um, or just dispersal limits, right? That the seeds just can't travel that far for a plant or the animals just can't get across to this certain island. And that's why this species is not found there. Also, when we look at distribution of species, um, looking across on a global pattern, uh, we can certainly start to start talking about biomes, right? Specific regions of the earth that have distinctive uh, life forms. In aquatic biomes, uh, the main determining factors here would be um, saltwater versus freshwater. There are very few organisms that are able to go in between and live in both environments. Uh, for terrestrial biomes, uh, this is mainly determined by climate. And, and as you can see from the map here, map, uh, with all the biomes marked out, climate is distributed on a north to south basis across the globe. Right? So we see big bands of specific biomes, especially across Europe and Asia, right? That big landmass there, we see the uh, east-west distribution of single biomes. And for these terrestrial biomes, like I said, it's mainly climate, and that um, the two main determinants in climate would be uh, temperature and rainfall. Um, 
they're not going to ask, they're not going to expect you to know the exact, you know, values for any of these biomes, um, but certainly trends, right? Deserts tend to be hot and dry, right? Tropical forests are hot and wet, right? Tundra is cold and dry, right? These basic trends, um, you should sort of be aware of, even though we're not really going to get, we're not going to spend any time talking about any of these specific biomes. So then looking within a single geographical range, um, how are the individuals of that population uh, sort of distributed throughout that area? So there are three basic patterns that we may see, um, the clumped pattern, uh, uniform pattern, and random pattern. Right? Clumped pattern uh, usually arises due to resource availability. Uh, uniform patterns are mainly in individualistic, uh, very territorial animals. Um, and then a random distribution, very often seen with plants. Um, if resources are evenly distributed throughout an area, um, the plants will just grow wherever the seeds fall. Okay, so that's sort of the distribution within their geographical range. So the last topic I wanna to cover here with populations is the way that the populations are structured, right? What is the age makeup of the populations and what are some of the, some of the factors that may control um, the way a population looks? The data that would be collected about this um, would be tabulated in something like called a life table here. Um, and one of the main pieces of data that we would draw from that is this, which is um, called a survivorship curve. Right? And there are three um, major patterns of survivorship curves. Um, there are a few others, but these, these are the three big ones. Uh, type one, usually seen in large mammals. Uh, death rate is very, very low among young individuals. Um, type two uh, survivorship curve has a very constant death rate all throughout the organism's life. And then a type three survivorship curve has a very high death rate early in life and then a much lower death rate once they reach maturity. Right? So that would be something like um, the oyster there, right? The uh, marine mollusk. Some other um, things that we would want to think about with population structure, um, how many offspring does an individual have at any given time? Right? So there are some species that um, produce lots of offspring with very little investment into each. Um, that would be the dandelion example here. Hundreds of seeds, but not a whole lot of energy invested into each one. Uh, and then the opposite extreme is uh, organisms that have very few offspring at a time, but invest lots of resources in them, like the Brazil nut tree, right? Very few seeds, but there's a lot of energy there. So each of those Brazil nut seeds has a better chance of surviving than each individual dandelion. But because of the way um, these two organisms have evolved, they both are very successful. Um, and then the final thing that I wanna to touch on here is something uh, called density dependent population regulation. It's right? something that um, these factors that will control the size of a population and the effect of these factors listed here or shown here uh, increases as the population size increases. Okay, so competition, territor territoriality, right? As the population grows, these factors are going to have more of an effect on the population and keeping that population size in check. Okay, so that is the end of part one with populations. Uh, in part two, we'll start adding more species in and talk about community ecology. In part two, here I'm going to look at community ecology. So this is what happens when different populations, different species start to live and interact with each other, right? What are some of the ways that these communities can be structured? And what are the ways, or a few of the ways that these communities 
can then interact with each other. Okay, so we'll start with community structure. Okay, and a few things that we want to look at here, um, starting with one of the other um, formulas that will be available to you on the formula sheet. Um, and that is this measure of the diversity of a community. All right, so here we have uh, two theoretical communities. Uh, and you see the percentages there of the uh, four different species of, uh, of tree found in that community. Uh, and a way that we can measure these com two communities and compare their diversity scores is uh, using this Simpsons diversity index, right? And you see the formula there, right? One minus the sum of the number of organisms of a single species divided by the total number of organisms uh, squared, right? Remember that that sigma there um, represents the sum. So if we were to do this this calculation for each of those two uh, hypothetical species find that community one, remember that had 25% of each, um, has a diversity index of 0 0.75, and community two, uh, that had different amounts of each uh, individual species, um, has a little bit lower diversity index, uh, 0.335. All right, not really surprising. Um, the community that had greater, uh, that had a more balanced number, um, is going to be slightly more diverse. All right, so that formula, I can go back to it, um, this Simpsons diversity index, again, just like all of these formulas, it will be provided to you with the test, so there's no need to memorize it. You just may be asked to do a calculation with it. Another way that we can look at uh, community structure is by assigning all the, the organisms into different trophic levels, right? And we'll certainly talk about trophic levels again uh, in part three when we get into energy moving through the ecosystem. Uh, but it is also an important piece here in how the community is structured. Looking at the different trophic levels uh, in this way, this is uh, what we call a food chain. Right, looking at one representative species of each trophic level from the primary producers all the way up through possible quaternary consumers. Right, so there's a nice linear uh, representation. A little bit more realistic representation is with a food web, right, which shows the fact that animals generally eat more than one food source. Right, they will feed. Um, for the most part, on whatever is available to them. Um, and this also illustrates another important point, uh, which oftentimes gets lost uh, when looking at these and or thinking about these trophic levels, and that's animals are not locked in to one particular trophic level. Right? The trophic level that they are operating on at any given point will depend on what they're eating. Right, And beyond that, it may depend also on the on what their meal has eaten before that, right? So sometimes you have to go back a few steps to really figure out what trophic level a particular animal is working on, right? Is it a secondary, tertiary, maybe a quaternary consumer, right? You need to actually take some steps back. Another uh, measure or another thing that uh, we may want to look at in terms of community structure is what are some important individual species uh, found in that community. Some examples here, um, dominant species, keystone species, and indicator species. Dominant species, very straightforward, that is the one that is the most common. Right? It has the largest numbers. Um, for the most part on terrestrial ecosystems, that's going to be some sort of plant, right? Some sort of a primary producer. And in aquatic ecosystems, it will oftentimes also be some producer. Okay, so keystone species, uh, these are species that have a very large effect on the overall community, right? Not always the most dominant species, um, but a large effect beyond what we may expect from their maybe small numbers. Uh, so for example here, uh, these uh, sea stars are the keystone species in many uh, intertidal pool biomes. 
um, because they are predators. They eat many other organisms and keep everything in check. Right? And you see from the graph there, um, if the sea star is removed, um, the community actually collapses because everything gets out of balance. A special type of, key, of uh, keystone species are referred to as ecosystem engineers. Okay, and these are things like beavers, as shown here, that will fundamentally change the physical environment, like the physical ecosystem. Right, beavers um, will build dams and will stop flowing water, and they will turn a stream into a pond. Right, that is a fundamental change in the ecosystem. Okay, so they are considered considered ecosystem engineers. Okay, and the last species here um, is the uh, indicator species. Okay, and these are um, there's two ways that we can actually look at an indicator species. Um, one way um, is uh, the frog here um, can be used as one particular species to track um, to kind of gauge the overall health of an ecosystem. Uh, and amphibians are very useful for this. Uh, because they have such thin skin, um, a lot of the environmental pollutants uh, will enter into their bodies and will have an effect before it may start affecting other animals like mammals, birds, uh, or reptiles. Uh, the other way that we could use uh, indicator species is with a series of species that we know have different tolerances to different levels of pollution. So here we see a range of uh, what, five different species here. Um, and by measuring the relative amounts of these different species in an ecosystem, we can get an idea of how healthy that particular ecosystem is. Right? If we only see hog lice and tube effects worms, we know that there is a moderate to a high level of pollution. If instead we see a lot of the nymphs Right, either the stonefly or the dragonfly nymphs, we know that there are fairly low levels of pollution. Okay, uh, along with the community uh, structure there, uh, we can also talk about ecosystem succession. Okay, and this is, uh, we kind of think of this as the pattern of an ecosystem actually being set up. Okay, and there are two types of succession, right? There's primary succession and secondary succession. And the difference is mainly whether or not there is soil present, right? And soil right, is not just dirt, right? Soil is actually full of organic materials um, and it's often full of living organisms, like all of the bacteria, any of the fungal uh, spores that may be living in, there, in, in the soil, right? So soil is a very important part of the ecosystem. So in a primary succession, uh, this is the first time life has established itself in a new area. So we would see this um, as shown here when glaciers recede and uncover new land. Uh, we would also see a primary succession after a volcanic eruption. And if a large area is covered with lava um, and then that harden it hardens into rock, then as life comes back, that would be a primary succession. Secondary succession occurs when life has already been established, but there is some large disturbance, like a fire. Okay, in these pictures here, um, before, or not before, but immediately after, and then a year later, um, after a large fire wiped out many of the living organisms, but the soil has remained intact. As you see from that after picture, life can come back pretty rapidly and comes back very healthy. All right, so that's uh, sort of a community structure. So now let's take a look at what happens when these two different, when multiple populations sort of get together and start to interact with each other. So when we look at these interactions, uh, we generally kind of score them as to whether whether or not they have a positive or a negative effect on the two populations. So 
looking here, uh, competition, 10 is a negative negative interaction meaning that two, both populations will be limited in terms of the number of resources that, that will be available. So both populations will have a negative impact, right? They will be smaller than if each population was there independently. Okay, the next three um, are categorized as exploitation interactions, right? Where one species is benefiting, right? That's the positive, And then one species is harm, right? That is the negative. So predation, herbivory, parasitism, right? These all benefit one species and harm the other. And then our final two interactions there um, are positive interactions, uh, mutualism. This is a, an interaction where both species are benefiting. And then commensalism is uh, what, what I think to be fairly rare, uh, where one species is benefiting and the other species is not affected at all, right? So that's a positive zero type interaction. So the uh, the final thing I wanna talk about here, um, I've kind of lumped under uh, what I call sort of consequences of these interactions, right? What are some of the long-term uh, evolutionary trends of two populations living in close proximity to each other and interacting over thousands, millions of years, perhaps? So some things we can look at um, in terms of competition um, that will lead to a few things um, like uh, competitive exclusion and resource partitioning, right? That sort of means that these different populations will each have their own little niche, right? They'll have their own little area that they will get resources from. And that's due to so what can be very intense uh, competition. Um, competition can also lead to uh, character displacement, uh, meaning that when two species live separately, uh, they may have very similar phenotypes, but when they live together, their phenotypes will tend to separate a little bit more so that they are not directly competing with each other as much. We can also, uh, the last thing I want to talk about here um, is some of the uh, coloration effects that we may see. Um, and these are due to different types of, of interactions between populations. Uh, cryptic coloration, uh, that is when animals are camouflaged to blend into their environment, right? And this can work either to escape a predator to not be noticed, or it can work for a predator uh, to blend into its environment and not be noticed by the prey. Uh, sort of the opposite of that is the aposematic coloration, right? The bright coloring of poisonous animals, right? Like our poison dart frog there, uh, very brightly colored, and that warns other predators to stay away because they know that that bright coloring means that this is a poisonous animal and not to try to eat it. Um, and then finally, we have mimicry. Um, there are a few different types of mimicry. I don't think it's really important to understand all the, all the differences between the types, um, but mimicry is when one uh, harmless animal or harmless organism uh, looks very similar to a potentially harmful organism. Uh, in the example here, um, there is a caterpillar that looks very, very similar to a venomous snake. So birds will tend to stay away from that caterpillar and not, uh, not prey on it because it looks like something that would prey on them. Okay, so that is it for community ecology. That was a very short section, um, but there are some important topics in there. The final section of the video here will be covering uh, energy and ecosystems. So now we have expanded out once again, out from communities, looking at groups of different species, out to the entire ecosystem as a whole. And now we are not only taking in to account all of the living uh, biotic aspects of the ecosystem, we are now also going to be looking at some of the non-living or abiotic features of that ecosystem and how they impact uh, the way energy and nutrients move through the ecosystem. Right? That is uh, energy and nutrient movement will be our main focus here. So when we start looking at energy and nutrient movements 
overall pattern, energy, as shown with the red lines here, uh, energy flows through an ecosystem, meaning that it is coming in uh, for the most part from the sun and is moving through the different uh, trophic levels here and then exiting the ecosystem right at each different level there is a little bit of energy lost right remember anytime energy is transferred or transformed there is some energy loss nutrients or chemicals uh will cycle through right they will be recycled they stay generally within an ecosystem and are generally able to be reused over and over again by the different organisms and one very important trophic level, uh, which oftentimes gets overlooked and not always included um, in food chains or food webs, are the uh, detritivores and the other microorganisms uh, shown there that are the main recyclers. Right? They, um, as other organisms die, uh, they will feed on that uh, dead organic matter and release many of the nutrients back into the soil to be recycled again through the ecosystem. Um, and as we look at this, right, we see the uh, different trophic levels again, right? Producers, consumers. Um, and we sh I showed this back in the uh, part two uh, with community structure. Uh, but here are the trophic levels again, right? From primary producers, those are the photosynthetic organisms, um, up to the consumers, they are the primary consumers, right? Those are all of the herbivores. And then secondary, tertiary, quaternary consumers, uh, the different levels of carnivores or uh, maybe even omnivores. Slightly more realistic depiction of that is the food web. And remember that animals especially above the primary consumer level are not locked in to one particular trophic level right the trophic level that they are operating on uh, will really depend on their meal right what are they eating at any given point with these uh with these food webs and food chains right we're really looking at the flow of energy uh, but they are they also play a role in the movement of nutrients um, and there are these biogeochemical nutrient cycles, right? These large uh, ecosystem-wide processes that move these uh, chemical nutrients through the different trophic levels, through different areas of an ecosystem, right? And this is both um, abiotic and biotic factors. Uh, one thing uh, to kind of remember about these, um, and I think the important thing to remember um, is these different reservoirs, right? These big stores of these nutrients. Um, and there are uh, kind of four different reservoirs here, um, and they are categorized as either organic or inorganic materials. And those, the nutrients in those reservoirs will either be available or unavailable for living things. Okay, and nutrients will move between these four different reservoirs through a number of different mechanisms. I don't think that it is terribly important for you to look at each of those cycles and try to memorize the, the reservoirs or memorize the steps, um, but just keep in mind that those four reservoirs uh, pretty much exists for all of those uh, major nutrient cycles there. The, uh, the next topic that I want to talk about is uh, the energy production. Right? How um, are these different ecosystems uh, producing their energy and how can we, you know, what are some ways that we can measure that? Um, textbooks may have a few formulas here. Um, they don't show up on the eight test formula sheet. So I didn't include them here. So I, I don't really think that they are too terribly important. Um, but kind of understanding these different measurements of energy production um, may, be very, may be important. Um, so the first measure we have um, is called primary production, right? And this is just a measure of how much sunlight is converted into usable chemical energy, right? This, these, these organic molecules. Um, and looking at the globe here, um, 
we see some very bright spots, right? Moving into orange and red. Um, that would be the tropical rainforests, right? But most of the globe, of course, is covered with water. Um, and that has a relatively low um, primary production. But when we take into account the size of the open ocean, right? And how much of the earth it covers, um, we see that the overall percentage of the primary production of the earth come is uh, about a quarter of it comes from that open ocean, right? Very large area, but a very small production, right? The next largest um, region in terms of percentage um, is the tropical rainforest, right? Which has the exact opposite relationship um, that the open ocean does, right? It is a very, very productive region, but it is a very, very small percentage of the earth. Right, so those are our two most productive areas in terms of creating usable energy from the sunlight. Uh, so that's primary production. Uh, secondary production is then looking at the consumers and how much of what they eat is actually converted into new biomass or new bodies. So an example here, uh, Let's take a caterpillar, right? Little eating machines say that it eats 200 joules worth of plant material. Um, 100 of that is not used by the caterpillar, right? That is uh, released as waste material. Um, the other 100 is assimilated, right? Brought into the caterpillar's body. Um, and some of that is used for cellular respiration, right? Just the caterpillar uh, moving around and surviving. Um, and the other, uh, what, 33 out of the 100 assimilated is act the actual uh, energy that goes towards new growth, right? New biomass, right? And that would be the secondary production, right? So we would say that the caterpillar here is working at about 33% secondary production, right? Because 33%, 33 out of 100 of the assimilated uh, joules have been converted into new biomass. Okay, something else that we would want to look at when we think about productivity in different ecosystems is what are the limits on how much a particular uh, ecosystem can produce, right? And we have different um, criteria, uh, different limiting factors for aquatic ecosystems and for uh, terrestrial ecosystems. In an aquatic ecosystem, um, it's generally light and nutrient availability, right? And light would be a function of the depth of the water and uh, nutrient availability. Um, see, uh, shown by the graph here, um, in this particular area, it is mainly nitrogen, right? We add more nitrogen in the form of ammonium, see the production goes way up, whereas adding phosphate, doesn't have much of an effect. For terrestrial organisms, uh, not surprisingly, uh, the two major uh, determinants or two major limits on production are temperature and moisture, right? Which are the two main determinants of the biome, right? Uh, the two major cli climatic factors which determine uh, what lives in a certain area. The final piece that I want to hit on here with uh, energy and ecosystems is kind of looking back at our different trophic levels and looking at some of the patterns that we may see with the way energy moves between them. So uh, when uh, another way to look at the trophic levels is by drawing um, an energy pyramid or, or a biomass pyramid, right? There's a few different ways of drawing these, um, but they all kind of end up looking very, very similar, right? Here we have a energy pyramid, right? Looking at the total um, energy content of each uh, trophic levels from primary producers up to tertiary consumers. A kind of standard rule here is called the rule of 10, where 10% 10 of the available energy in, 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 a, in a given trophic level is passed on to the next trophic level. So if 10,000 joules of energy is contained within the primary producers, only 1,000 of that will actually be passed on to the primary consumers, right? And then only 100 of that thousand are passed on to the secondary consumers. So this uh, sort of limits the number of trophic levels that are found in a given biome.
right? We generally do not go beyond the tertiary consumer level. We may have a few quaternary consumers in some very productive areas, but for the most part, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary consumers, and that's about the limit because there just simply are not, a, there's not enough energy to support another trophic level above that tertiary consumer. Uh, we could also draw these based on biomass. Um, and here's a couple examples. Um, like I said, they look, uh, the top one there at least looks very, very similar. Um, the bottom uh, graph there is a very specific um, situation. And this only occurs in some very isolated areas where there is actually a very small number, a small population of producers that actually supports a larger population of consumers. Okay, and this only works when the producers uh, reproduce very, very quickly. Okay, and that small population is able to regenerate itself rapidly enough to actually support a larger population above it, you know, one trophic level above. Okay, but those are very, very rare. Right? For the most part, uh, the biomass pyramids are going to look like the one above. Okay, so that is it for Unit 8, uh, Ecology. I hope that all made sense, and good luck on your task. Dropping science like Galileo dropped the orange.